<clears throat> Can I start? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of you out there on Zoom and all here in, per in person at our Unitarian Universal Society Sunday Morning Forum. My name is Dolores Perez Heilbrunn, and I'm co chair of the Human Rights Working Group with Jeff Peckbill and Melvin Starks who is managing our breakfast table over there. And by the way, everybody go and get this delicious breakfast. It's really good, really good. Thank you, Melvin. Our human rights working group works closely with the forum and Bruce Newberger, who is a chair of the forum. Before I introduce our speaker for today, Tim Redman, I'd like to point out that this will be an interactive event with Q and A session beginning at about 10.30 or so. So for those of you online, please enter your questions in your chat box and we'll get them here. And for those of you here, please write out your questions on the paper that's on the chairs and we will handle that. I'd like to introduce Robin Larson. Robin, will you stand? <laughs> Robin will be in charge of the Q&A session and handling your questions. This presentation will end about 1045 before our Sunday service down the hall, which starts at 11. Now I would like to introduce David Heilbrunn, who will give our Ohlone recognition statement. David? Am I on camera? <laughs> yeah. Good morning. <clears throat> we, the members of the First Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco, acknowledge that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone people who inhabited what is now San Francisco Peninsula. Anthropologists say that these indigenous communities lived in and moved through this area for over 10,000 years. As the original stewards of this land, the Ohlone and other indigenous peoples understood the interconnectedness of all things and maintained harmony with all of nature for millennia. We honor them now for their enduring commitment to our mother earth. Thank you, David. And now I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Tim Redman, who is the editor of 48 Hills. He's been a longtime friend and very popular guest speaker here at the UU. Tim? Thank you, and thank you all. Just making sure. I hope everybody can see me and hear me on Zoom. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for tuning in if you're on Zoom. I'm really happy to be here. And there's a few things I wanna talk about tonight tonight, this morning. I don't even know. <laughs> a few things I want to talk about this morning. And one of them is something that we've been reading a lot about in the news media lately and hearing a lot about those of you who are on social media. It has been pervasive. And that is this question of crime in San Francisco. And I want to talk about the reality and the mythology of crime in San Francisco. And I want to talk about that in the context of what I call the flawed media narrative that we're seeing in San Francisco. Um, the way that news media works and has always worked, but with social media works even more today, is a narrative gets put out. Somebody breaks a story, something happens. And we see this, we're seeing this now with crime. We're also gonna talk a little bit about the media narrative on housing, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, you get this narrative out there. Somebody puts out a story, something happens, and it feeds on itself. 
And we get this idea that crime is out of control, is rampant in San Francisco, and then that leads to policy decisions that are often very, very bad. And we are seeing that right now with crime in San Francisco. We're also seeing it with housing in San Francisco. And we're seeing it with homelessness in San Francisco. So I'm going to try to unpack media narratives for you a little bit and then talk about challenging and questioning those media narratives. Then um, I'm going to try to talk, given time, a little bit about what we're going to see in the next year in San Francisco politics. 2024 is going to be a very, very busy year in San Francisco politics, and there's a lot of really important stuff happening. So with any luck, we'll make it work time-wise. I'll try to stop at maybe 20 after to take time for questions. I've already got one. Um, please fill out questions on the card. I'm happy to take questions, and I'll talk about the things I just said, but then I'm happy to talk about anything else involving San Francisco politics that you want to discuss or you want to talk about. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me share screen for those of you on Zoom. And everybody can see this, right? Yes. Okay. It's up on the screen. All right. So a few weeks ago, a tech executive named Bob Lee was murdered in the Rincon Hill neighborhood of San Francisco. Right. Um, he was stabbed to death at about 2.15 in the morning on the 300 block of Main Street. When I first heard about this and the police reports originally came out, it seemed a little curious to me. I, I, I teach journalism at University of San Francisco and I teach investigative reporting. And one of the things that I always teach my students to look for is what I call JDLRs. Anyone want to guess what JDLR stands for? Investigative reporter's first clue. JDLR just doesn't look right. Something that just doesn't look right. It, and I looked at this and I thought, okay, wait a minute. What is this gentleman doing in the 300 block of Main Street in Rincon Hill at 2.15 in the morning? It, it's, there's not a lot of restaurants or bars near there. It's a long ways from the hotel he was staying in. It was kind of weird. What was he doing there? But the narrative we got is right here. Some pointing to the killing as proof that San Francisco crime is out of control. The Chronicle says, though violent crime is at historic lows. Okay, there have been 13 homicides so far in San Francisco this year. Any homicide is a horrible thing, horrible tragedy. Right. When I first moved to San Francisco in 1981, we were in the midst of the crack epidemic in San Francisco. There were over 200 homicides that year. OK, we are on track for maybe 25 at this pace. Homicides are way down in San Francisco. Violent crime is way down in San Francisco. And the Chronicle does say that, although violent crime is near historic lows, but they continue on. Came as the tech community has been raising alarm about the state of San Francisco, arguing that crime and fear of public safety are factors deterring companies and employees from returning to the hollowed out downtown. The city's core faces a potential doom loop scenario. Some in tech, including Twitter, Elon, Twitter CEO Elon Musk, immediately seized on the killing. Elon Musk goes out and tweets that San Francisco is a horrible place. Crime is out of control. Something must be done. The city's not doing anything about it. Right. This then becomes the media narrative. This gets picked up by the New York Times. It gets picked up by, of course, Fox News. Um, Tucker Carlson, before he was summarily fired, goes on the air and says, my God, San Francisco's terrible. The governor of New York and the mayor of New York both said, New York City is not going to become San Francisco. All right, now, I remember years ago when we talked about the Manhattanization of San Francisco and all these people in San Francisco trying to become New York <laughs> with all the tall buildings. New York City is not going to become as if San Francisco is this horrible, dangerous, crime-ridden place that's falling apart. And I think all of us, I mean, I live in San Francisco. I walk around the city all the time. 
I'm not seeing that. I am seeing a lot of human tragedy on the streets. I am seeing homeless people who we are not taking care of. I am seeing drug use on the streets. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I'm not seeing San Francisco completely falling apart into this lawless place. Okay, but that narrative has consequences, right? That narrative leads the mayor and the district attorney to say, we are going to start cracking down on crime and arresting more people, right? It leads the governor, Gavin Newsom, to tell us that he's sending the National Guard into the tenderloin. Now, think about this for a second, all right? The National Guard. Okay, the National Guard, as you probably all know, um, was brought into place in the days when we feared, for example, a Japanese invasion of the West Coast during World War II. We would have the National Guard in boats going up and down the coast, guarding the coast along with the Coast Guard and preparing for an invasion of the United States. Since then, the National Guard has typically been used in modern times in um, disasters. The National Guard comes in to help out after a massive flood, after an earthquake, after fires, right? The national members of the National Guard do not have arrest powers. These are not police officers, most of them. They are not trained as police officers, right? They are not trained to patrol the streets. They certainly have no training in dealing with the very complex problem of drug sales and drug use on the streets. Why is the National Guard coming in? And now this is all that the National Guard has been called into San Francisco to the Tenderloin because it's so messed up. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Right? All this is going to do is further militarize the concept of law enforcement in San Francisco. We're already going way down that path. I, you know, I watched a few weeks ago the Board of Supervisors discuss the Thank God, by law now, the police have to release a list of all of the military equipment that they have. Military style equipment that the San Francisco Police Department has and the San Francisco Sheriff's Department has. Right? This list is pretty incredible. We have like the equivalent of a tank. We have this like armored troop carrier that the San Francisco Police Department has. I'm not sure why. We have robots that are now armed. We have killer robots. We have robots that are, have the ability to go in and shoot people. Right now, the cops say, this is all fine because there's a human being at the other end of that robot. Somebody wanted to know about driverless vehicles in SF. I'll talk about that later. How long do you think it's going to be before someone develops an AI algorithm that decides when to use lethal force? All right, not very long. So we are further militarizing law enforcement in San Francisco and because the mayor and the DA have decided on this, we're gonna start arresting a lot more people. Now, again, I'm very old. I lived through the war on drugs. We all know the war on drugs was a spectacular failure. All it did was criminalize generations of people, predominantly black men, and send people to prison for very long sentences. It was not effective in dealing with drug addiction, drug abuse, drug sales. It was very effective in, turn, in, in creating a carceral state in the United States. This is the direction we want to go again in San Francisco. But that's because of this media narrative. Now, the media narrative really started when Chesa Boudin was elected district attorney. And that media narrative was started by the police, particularly the police union. The police union hated Chesa Boudin because he dared to indict police officers for shooting people. The police union, essentially what we saw under Chesa was a work stoppage, an unauthorized work stoppage. The cops stopped making arrests. And they started telling people when your car was broken into, they'd come and say, I can't do anything because the district attorney won't prosecute anyway. Right? So they started this narrative that crime is out of control and it's because of the DA. The mayor, whose candidate didn't get elected, and the mayor of San Francisco is known to be a bit vindictive politically, her candidate didn't get elected. She wanted to get rid of Chesa Boudin. She also played into this narrative, right? That under Chesa Boudin, crime is out of control. Well, again, violent crime is down. Right? There was an uptick during the pandemic in car break-ins and garage break-ins in neighborhoods. And there's a reason for that. There have always been car break-ins in San Francisco. There are, in fact, organized groups who break into cars, steal stuff, and then sell it on the black market, right? For many, many years, they operated mainly on Fisherman's Wharf and in Union Square, places where there's tourists. And tourists, they, we'd see this a lot at um, 
uh, 49ers games when the 49ers were in candlestick. In fact, um, I met a couple of years ago, the chief counsel to the Mexican consulate here. We were both at a trial and we got to talking and he talked about how um, people in Mexico love the San Francisco 49ers. And there's one other team they really like. So a lot of people from Mexico would come up to San Francisco to catch 49ers game. And when that was happening on Sunday, he would bring an extra staff to the embassy on Monday morning because the embassy would be crowded with people who left their wallets, their passports, their stuff in their car, and it got broken into in the candlestick parking lot. And now they had to get their passport replaced so they could go home. This happened, all right? During the pandemic, there were no tourists. So those break-ins moved into the neighborhoods, which made people think, oh my God, the neighborhoods are unsafe. I don't know how many of you are on next door. Next door is horrible in many ways. I, I follow it because I follow a lot of different media. In the early days of next door, it was nothing but racism. Nothing but in my neighborhoods, nothing but, oh my God, watch out. I just saw a group of Latino men walk up the street. Right? I mean, literally, so the next door is doing a little bit better at policy. But I saw, I live in Bernal Heights, two of my neighbors complaining on next door that somebody broke into their car and stole their backpacks with their laptops and their passports while the car was parked in their driveway in front of their house. I mean, why do you leave your backpack, your laptop, and your passport in your car when it's parked in the driveway in front of your house, right? But this perception, of course, adds to the idea that there's crime. And of course, the cops aren't solving car break-ins. The cops weren't solving car break-ins 20 years ago either. It's virtually impossible. This happens so fast. It's very hard to solve car break-ins. But anyway, so the mayor, the foes of Chesa Boudin, create this narrative that crime is out of control in San Francisco. It spreads to the press and it gives us this, right? This national narrative and what we started seeing, proof that San Francisco crime is out of control. And then immediately, immediately, the narrative shifts to homeless people, right? The homeless people are violent psychopaths who are killers. And that's who must have killed Bob Lee. It was a random stabbing by a homeless person in downtown San Francisco. Well, all right. I don't know how many of you have walked through the 300 block of Main Street at 2.45 in the morning. There are not a lot of homeless people wandering that area at 2.45 in the morning. It seemed, again, a JDLR. It seemed a little weird to me. And it turns out that, it, that, that this was not the story. It turns out that he was stabbed by someone he knew. As, by the way, the police chief pointed out, as is the case in most homicides. Most homicides are not random. He was killed by another tech exec who was driving around in the car with him who was mad because he, Bob Lee, may have been flirting with the other guy's sister, and they may have been doing drugs, all right? Again, these people have been drinking since three o'clock in the afternoon. God knows what else they were doing. It is 2.45 in the morning, and this guy, driving around with his friend in the car, gets out of the car and stabs him to death. Right? He has now been arrested and is being charged with homicide. I, I don't know what's gonna come of that case. This isn't allegations. This has not been proven. People are innocent until proven guilty, but it's pretty clear that a random homeless person did not stab Bob Lee, okay? And yet that's the media narrative that's been created and it is still with us and we still can't get rid of it. San Francisco is not safe. Okay, fast forward a couple of weeks, all right? Um, let me move this if I can get to where it is. I believe this is right, no? Okay, we'll get right to that. All right. A um, former member of the San Francisco Fire Commission is beaten with a metal pole out in front of his house. All right. Um, the narrative becomes San Francisco is unsafe. My God, this guy lives in the marina. And he is, you know, a native San Franciscan and a member of the former member of the fire commission. They don't mention that he owns 14 cannabis um, dispensaries um, and that he's a very wealthy man and his parents who live next door are quite wealthy. At any rate, it's not even safe in the marina now. A random homeless person could come up to you with a knife and beat you over the head and, um, it, it, you know, it, and, and, nothing, and gets away with it. Nothing's ever going to happen. Okay. Well, the story, it turns out, is a little different. All right, I'm going to see if I can play this short about two minute clip for you, and it may not work, 
Um, I'm going to try to play this for you. And if the mic thing doesn't work, you're all going to have to just be really quiet. And my computer's going to have to play. This is an interview with the guy um, whose name I'm going to mangle. But this is an, an interview with the guy shortly after he was assaulted. Let's see if I can make this work. We're better now. Okay. What Mr. Carbagnani says in that interview is the following. I've lived here all my life. I am one of the people, we built this city. This is our city. We built this city and now we are being driven out. We, the law abiding people who built the city are being draw, driven out, right? And we are being driven out. And he literally says this by the animals on the streets, all right? We are being driven out by the animals on the streets and the police won't do anything about it because there's some grand conspiracy that goes up to some level he can't even explain that are telling the police not to do anything about this. All right. Now, let's unpack that for a minute. First of all, you saw his picture. When he says, we built this city and this is our city, who is he talking about? We. White people. Who are the animals on the streets? People who are not necessarily white people. All right. Now, let's go back. Oh, I'll get to that. Okay. I want to show you a couple of videos, and these ones we do not need sound for. Okay. A gentleman is arrested and charged with hitting Mr. Carmignani over the head with a metal pipe. All right. Now, hitting someone over the head with a metal pipe is always a bad thing, and he was severely injured. I'm not justifying this in any way. All right. But because of the way things work in, in California and the United States right now, when someone is arrested, the prosecution has to turn over to the, to the defense anything that might be considered exculpatory. So the defense knows everything the prosecution knows. I want to watch this video for a second. Okay, what is going on there? It's not even mace. It's bear spray. Bear spray is a form of pepper spray that is so concentrated that the manufacturers, and I looked up the manufacturers of this product, say this should never be used on a human being. This is very dangerous stuff. This is potentially lethal. All right. It is the same oleoresin capsicum that's in pepper spray, right? but pepper spray is not designed to be lethal. The, the pepper spray that you can buy in the store that the cops are equipped with, it can cause a lot of problems. It's not designed to kill a human being. Bear spray is so much more concentrated. I mean, bears are much bigger than people. If you want to scare a bear off and get them to run away, you need you, the average pepper spray isn't going to do anything. So they make it highly concentrated and they make it spray a lot further with a lot, with a lot stronger. Okay, so this, this, this gentleman is bear spraying a homeless person. Okay, now, this is the day of the incident in which the metal pipe was involved. That was him spraying the- uh... Yeah, that was him spraying that homeless person. Now, here he comes again. Yeah. Right, after that first time, in fact, and here he goes. Now he goes and sprays the homeless person in front of his house. And he sprays him again, right? And that person ends up hitting him with a metal pipe, okay? More to the story here. All right, it turns out there have been eight incidents in the past month in this neighborhood in the marina where an individual who looks, has the same build and the walk, appears to be Don Carmignani, goes around bear spraying homeless people in the neighborhood, all right? Now, what the, his, what, uh, the lawyer for the person who has been arrested for this says, is you could certainly argue this with self-defense. I am not in any way justifying anyone hitting anyone else over the head with a metal pipe. I am also not justifying anybody bear spraying homeless people to try to get them out of the neighborhood. All right. This in, in this video, it appears that Mr. Carbignani bear sprayed this homeless person who then went after him with a metal pipe. All right. Now, again, neither of these is a good thing. And I'm not in any way justifying any form of violence. But it's a different story than a random homeless person randomly beating a guy in the head with a metal pipe in unsafe San Francisco where you can't even walk around the marina, right? And yet, 
this is the media narrative that we're hearing. Right? Also, by the way, I said there've been 13 homicides so far this year. How many of you have heard of any of them except Bob Lee? Maybe one, maybe one or two. You heard a couple of them. Yeah, well, you have to know how to use it, right? The news media, the front page of the Chronicle does not report when a low-income Latino homeless person is murdered in the mission. That's not news. It's only news when it's rich white guy. All right, that's just an aside, right? Uh, but, so now we have this media narrative that crime is out of control in San Francisco. And what does it lead to? It's gonna lead to more people going to jail, more people, many of, by the way, I am told, and again, the fentanyl epidemic is a terrible thing and people should not be selling fentanyl on the streets. I'm gonna come back to this in a second. Many of the people who are selling fentanyl on the streets are in fact, have been in fact trafficked themselves, right? Are in fact immigrants to the United States who were brought here with promises of jobs and then told you've got to go sell drugs in the tenderloin um, and um, have very little choice. No, there's, there's labor trafficking that goes on in the, in the United States. And this is, I am told, this is one of the things that happened. Okay, under Chesa Boudin, when people were arrested, for selling fentanyl, he didn't turn them over to ICE and they didn't get deported because he believed that that's double jeopardy. That's being punished twice for the same crime. You go to jail for selling fentanyl or you go on probate, whatever, they quit, but you shouldn't be deported at the same time. That has now changed, right? Now they are charging them, anyone who's selling fentanyl is charged with a deportable felony. So we're deporting people, right? We are putting more people in jail and guess what? And we're bringing in the National Guard and guess what? There are still the number of fentanyl overdoses in San Francisco is higher this month than it was before. Right. Now, there is actually a way to address this that has worked in dozens of cities around the country. And that is what we call safe injection sites. Right? The evidence is pretty clear on this that if you allow people who are drug users to go inside, to a place that is staffed with medical personnel who are trained to use Narcan, and you let them use drugs in a supervised environment, less people die. In fact, very few people die. In Vancouver, BC, where they've been doing this for years, the overdose death is very, very low. And as Vitka Eisen, the head of Health Right 360, said in an event I was at not too long ago, she said she was an IV drug user for many years. And she said she overdosed a bunch of times, got sick a bunch of times, went to the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic a bunch of times. This is many years ago. And she was treated with respect and kindness. And they helped her. And she said the first 10 times she went in there, she was treated with no judgment at all. And the 11th time she decided to get clean. And now she's the head of Health Right 360, all right? She says, this is what you want. You want safe injection sites, because people like her will come in there and maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, maybe they overdose four times and are saved by nurses with Narcan, maybe the seventh, eighth, ninth time, they're going to decide to accept help. And that is what the record shows in other cities, right? We had one of these in San Francisco, right? in the Tenderloin. We had a Tenderloin center where people could come in. And although it wasn't official, the city looked the other way, people were using drugs in there and they were trained staff to... Um, for, to prevent overdoses. The mayor shut that down, right? Now, the, the governor who's sending in the National Guard, all right, I don't give Scott Wiener credit for a lot of things. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I do give Scott credit for this. He, last year, got a bill through the state assembly that would legalize safe injection sites as a pilot project in San Francisco. Everyone in the public health community agrees this is the way to go, all right? Gavin Newsom vetoed the bill. Why? Because Gavin Newsom wants to run for president. Everyone knows this. We joke he's watching too many episodes of the West Wing. You all get that joke. My USF students don't because they're like 19 and 20 years old, but you all get the, the West Wing at reference. He's watching Gavin Newsom wants to run for president. He does not want to be the governor who legalized fentanyl use in San Francisco. Because of this narrative that we've created, this false media narrative about crime and drug use. Right? So now 200 people died of fentanyl overdoses last month. These are preventable. These are people whose lives, and as, as Vic Eisen says, once you're dead, you don't have a second chance to get help. 
right? Once you've overdosed and died, that chance to come back that seventh, eighth, ninth time and get into recovery never happens, right? We had a solution to this. There are people at the Board of Supervisors right now who are trying to say the city just needs to do it anyway. I don't care if Gavin Newsom, they're doing it in New York. They have three very successful safe injection sites in the city of New York that are working that are saving lives. And that, by the way, are getting drug users off the streets. I keep hearing this term, open air drug use. You've heard that term, right, too. That's in the media, open air drug use. That's something awful. Well, it happens to be that people who are homeless do not have a place to go inside to use drugs. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, that there are a lot of people in San Francisco who use drugs who are not homeless, right? But they aren't open air drug users. They're doing it in their apartment, in their home, right? Possibly. Possibly, I don't know this, but possibly Bob Lee was one of them, all right? Except he had a hotel room and a friend's apartment. Right? I'm not saying he was a drug user, but maybe he was. Right? The open air drug use simply refers to homeless people. Well, if you give them a place to go inside, they're not they're not shooting fentanyl on the streets. Right? The mayor is declining to do this because the city attorney, David Chu, says it's too risky for the city to defy state and federal law. I do not see Joe Biden sending the FBI to arrest the mayor of San Francisco for opening a safe injection facility. I don't see Gavin Newsom doing it either. Nevertheless, our current city attorney, who I believe is afraid of his own political shadow, will not take the risk to find a way to do this. They say we can't use city funds for this. Well, guess what? The city just settled with Big Pharma for like $30 million as part of the opioid settlement. Why can't we use that money? That's big pharma's money. Why don't we take that money in the sum and use that to, oh, David Chu says we can't do it, right? So now we know we have a solution that works to a problem that is plaguing people and that is deadly, right? We know what works, right? The governor has told us we can't do it. The city and the attorney, the attorney and the mayor are saying we can't do it. And so now people are dying on the streets. And the solution is to bring in the National Guard. That is the media narrative that we've created in San Francisco. All right, let me shift gears for a minute and we can talk more about this. But I want to shift gears and talk about another media narrative that's happening in San Francisco. And okay. And this one involves State Senator Scott Weiner who has already announced he is running for Nancy Pelosi's seat in Congress if Nancy Pelosi decides not to run. And most bets are that she will not run for reelection. And I say that because Scott is very plugged into the Democratic Party establishment. And if Nancy Pelosi was gonna run for, a second, for another term, he wouldn't have announced he's running. So Nancy Pelosi is probably gonna step down. And this sets off a whole string of dominoes that we'll talk about in a minute, All right? Well, let me just talk about this for a second. There's a, the, the other media narrative that's happening in San Francisco right now is that the reason there's a housing crisis and an affordability crisis is because the city hasn't built enough housing. And the reason the city hasn't built enough housing is because of the left, because of the progressives who don't want to see housing because we're all NIMBYs. All right. Scott Weiner, transcript with the National, with the New York Times. Here's what he says. All right, that's his life, went to law school. Okay. Politically, San Francisco is this weird combination of very progressive and quite conservative. Very progressive in a lot of ways that we'd consider what is progressive in terms of having a strong minimum wage and supporting immigrants and supporting LGBTQ people and so forth, getting rid of plastics. On the other hand, as a city in recent decades been very afraid of change. And this city is all about change. In a constant state of flux of people, I feel like I've gotten very scared of change. Hold on, he says here. When we say progressive in San Francisco, people mean various things. There are some strains of quote unquote progressivism that are actually quite conservative because they are against all forms of positive change. They wanna freeze frame everything and just freeze it in amber. Okay, then there are these radical people, more hard left socialist. That's an undercurrent here in San Francisco. Okay, let's unpack this for a second. This is the narrative 
that progressives are actually conservative because we don't want to see more housing built in San Francisco. We want to freeze the city in amber and we don't want to see any change. Okay, first of all, the word progressive has a meaning to me. It is a term with a long political history and it has a meaning to me. And part of that meaning has to do with economics. Progressives believe that economic inequality is a very serious problem in our society. In fact, as a self-described progressive, um, who was at the very least a democratic socialist, <laughs> I would say that economic inequality and climate change are the two greatest existential crises facing humanity right now, and they are connected. All right. And you cannot talk about social problems, whether it's crime or homelessness or, or the housing crisis in San Francisco, without talking about economic inequality. I would argue that it is economic inequality that has caused the housing crisis, right? If you taxed people at a reasonable rate, there wouldn't be as many rich people. And if there's not as many billionaires, no one can afford $100 million houses and prices come down, all right? Set that aside for a second. I was here in the 1980s when Dianne Feinstein as mayor decided that the future of San Francisco is high rise office buildings in downtown. And that we need to bring big corporations to downtown San Francisco and put their offices there. And we need to build more offices for them. In fact, when Feinstein was mayor, we built something like, developers built something like 35 million square feet of office space, more than existed in all of downtown Boston and San Francisco in a period of about 10 years, right? This was the goose that laid the golden egg, as she said at the time, all right? Obviously, that's turned out to not quite be so true. Let's set that aside for a moment, all right? It was the left, it was the progressives who were banging our heads against the wall demanding the developers build housing. Because you're bringing all of these new workers to San Francisco, all of these new high paid workers to work in these offices, where are they gonna live? They're gonna displace the people who are already here. Developers need to also build housing. We created something called the Office Housing Production Program, which required developers to build a certain amount of affordable housing for every new job that they created. The developers hated this, the mayor opposed it, right? And developers didn't build housing in the 80s and 90s. You know why? It had nothing to do with nimbyism. It had nothing to do with zoning. It had, had nothing to do with any of these things, right? There were people who live, for example, on the west side of town who don't want more density, and when you talk to people on the West side about density, they say one word, parking. It's all about parking, right? All right, we're gonna come back to that, right? There are also people who in the eighties were unhappy when Joe O'Donohue and the residential builders tore down vintage irreplaceable Victorian buildings to put up six story builder specials, right? I understand this is small time stuff. The big reason developers weren't building housing is because, right, and again, I hate it when people say the city needs to build more housing. How many times have you heard that? California needs to build more housing. The city needs to build more housing. Well, guess what? The city of San Francisco doesn't build housing. We haven't built housing since the 1960s. I wish the city would build housing. Developers build housing. And private developers build housing, not because they wanna meet a need in San Francisco, but because they wanna make a profit. That is how capitalism works. And these days, big development in San Francisco is not financed by your local savings and loan. This is international speculative capital. This is real estate investment trusts. This is hedge funds. This is pension funds. That capital goes where the return is highest. And in the 1980s and 1990s, the highest return was office space. You could, you could make more money building office space than building housing. So developers didn't build housing, right? Even though the left was out there pounding on the table and saying, you have to build housing. And now we are being blamed for the housing crisis, right? You've heard this narrative. Progressives are against building housing. Well, when you unpack that a little bit, there's a few things you need to understand. One is that media narrative is wrong. Progressives are the little ones clamoring for more housing. Two, we understand that building Market rate condominiums, in other words, multi-million dollar condominiums is not addressing the housing crisis in San Francisco. We do not have a housing crisis in San Francisco. Let me just come right out and say it. We have an affordable housing crisis, All right? If you make $650,000 a year and you have stock options that are worth millions of dollars, you can find a place to live in San Francisco. 
right? We have an affordable housing crisis. We have a crisis for people who are not rich to find a place to live in San Francisco. Right? There's plenty of housing for rich people, right? So the question then becomes, if we build more housing for rich people, will that help the rest of us? And the data on this increasingly says no. Now, this is a vicious academic debate. Michael Storper, who I, I brought out to speak about this, is a eminent economic geographer at UCLA, argues that, in fact, building market rate housing can cause more harm than good. And I'll tell you why. Let's say we build 100 multi-million dollar condos in downtown San Francisco and 200 wealthy people move in. It's actually closer to I think 2.1 per year. Let's say two, 200 wealthy people move in to those condos from someplace else. Okay, they're going to need someone to do their laundry and they're going to need someone to make their coffee in the morning and they're going to need someone to clean their house and they're going to need someone to drive them around, right? All of these things create jobs, good, but they also create minimum wage jobs and those people need a place to live. And what the data shows is if you don't build at least 40% affordable housing. In other words, if 40% of those 100 condos are not set aside for the people who are going to be doing the laundry and teaching their kids and driving them around and cleaning their houses, you lose ground. You make the housing crisis worse. Okay, so this is not, I'm against a, a 100 story. I'm not against 100 units of new housing, right? I think that we need to look at that as who's going to get that housing. And who are we building housing for? Who, who are the developers building housing for? Right. Nowadays, right, the city's housing element, which we approved to great fanfare, says that San Francisco is supposed to accommodate 82,000 new units of housing in the next eight years. Right. That's about 10,000 units a year. The city isn't going to build that housing. And by the way, 46,000 of those units have to be affordable, below market rate. Right. The city isn't building any of this housing. Nonprofit developers build the below market rate housing. For-profit developers build the high-end housing. Right? And guess what? No one's building any housing right now anyway. There's no way we're getting 10,000 units of housing a year. And that is not because of NIMBYs or zoning. We have already upzoned the city. Right? We have made all these, it, it, right? we are clearing out all the bureaucracy and red tape. We're going to get rid of conditional use hearings. We're going to make it, developers can just come in and build anywhere they want. And just wait until the bulldozers arrive in the sunset to start tearing down housing. Because right now in San Francisco, we are a dense city. There are very few places to build more dense housing without tearing down what's already there. All right. But again, set that aside for a minute. Even if we say this is great, even if we become Houston, which has no zoning at all, and everything is by right. If I want to build a 50-story building at, at Slope Boulevard where the Slope Garden Center is, you all seen those pictures, right? That 50-story building. In Houston, I can just walk into the building department, fill out a form, pay 50 bucks, and get a building built. Right? Fine, let's do that in San Francisco. It's still not going to get built. And it's not getting built because the Federal Reserve has raised the interest rate to the point where there's no profit in building housing right now. This is how capitalism works. Right? The developers of a big project on Oak and Van Ness just gave the site back to the bank. Right? There's this huge fuss about 469 Stevenson Street. Remember the story? Oh, we want to put the David Campos on the left wants to save a parking lot. This was used against him when he was running for assembly. You want to save a valet parking lot for Nordstrom's instead of building housing there. Well, guess what? This thing is now fully approved. The planning commission signed off on it. The supervisors questioned the EIR, separate question, but this thing is now fully approved. It's not getting built. Why not? Because Build Inc. doesn't even own the site and doesn't have financing for the project. Build Inc. just gave back a site on Oak and, and Van Ness because they don't have financing to build the project. Right. This is how the housing market works. This is how capitalism works. This has nothing to do with NIMBYs. Now, just personally, I get accused by the YIMBY movement of being against housing because they say, you want to preserve your property values. Well, first of all, I'm the only homeowner in Bernal Heights probably who wants property values to come down so more non-rich people can move in. Right. Um, second, it's weird that the Yimby folks cannot imagine anyone doing anything for anything but their own personal gain. They cannot imagine anyone taking a political position that would not benefit them personally. Right? And third, upzoning Bernal Heights makes my property more valuable. Upzone Bernal Heights for six stories and my house, my little tiny house in Bernal Heights becomes a teardown and I can sell it for twice as much as I could today. Right? So actually upzoning increases property values. So all of this stuff is just a fundamentally flawed media narrative. But where does it take us? It takes us to policies 
that allow developers to make more money by demolishing existing housing and building housing that does not help the crisis. All right. Many of those condos that were built in the last 10 years in downtown San Francisco are empty. As many as 30% when I last checked were empty. Right. Many of them are second and third homes. We went and ran the property tax records for a bunch of these a few years ago. And you can tell whether somebody typically you can tell whether somebody's living in their house by where the property tax bill goes. If the property tax bill goes to um, New York City, then either they're renting that condo out or it's a second home. Right. Um, and what we found is that more than 30 percent of these condos are not owner occupied. Some of them may be rentals, but we're seeing a lot of them that aren't rentals. They're just empty. Why? Because during that period, buying real estate in New York, LA, San Francisco, and Vancouver, BC was a very safe place to put your money. And there's a lot of offshore, offshore money. There's a lot of people in, for example, Russia and China who are worried about the stability of the government and their, the safety of their money. So they buy condos in New York, in Manhattan, San Francisco, LA, and Vancouver, BC. And one of the ways that we know this is happening is because Vancouver passed a law, which I think is a terrible idea, and I do not support this. But Vancouver passed a law saying you have to be a Canadian citizen to buy real estate in Canada, in Vancouver. Right. Again, terrible. I, I, this is against this is xenophobic. This is anti-immigrant. I hate it. Nevertheless, housing prices dropped immediately because that money wasn't coming in. All right. So flawed media. What does this lead to? As I say, it leads to giving developers giveaways. Pretty soon, what we're going to see is the city subsidizing. We're already starting to see developers talk about, it. you need to give us city subsidies, public money to build market rate housing because otherwise it doesn't pencil out. All right, again, this is not what we hear in the New York Times. Right? Literally, the New York Times is constantly talking about, it. the Chronicle is constantly quoting people saying, it's, the, the, it's because of zoning, it's because of the NIMBYs, and that's the progressives. We're the ones who are blocking housing. Right? And that is fundamentally untrue and starts and, and gives us a completely flawed media narrative. Okay, I'm just going to take five minutes now that I'm done with media narrative for the moment. I'm going to take five minutes and talk about some of what's going to happen in 2024. All right. And some of this is speculative, but I want you to get ready. You know, hold on, it's going to be a crazy year. Right. Scott Weiner, it appears, is going to run for Nancy Pelosi's seat in Congress when Nancy steps down and retires. All right. Um, we hear maybe her daughter's going to run. Also, Christine, although I haven't seen her anywhere in San Francisco in a long time. Maybe there'll be another candidate, but Scott Weiner will vacate his state Senate seat to do that. All right. I have already heard that Matt Haney, who couldn't even finish his first time at term as supervisor and then ran for the state assembly, is now going to not finish his term in the state assembly and run for state Senate, which will open up an assembly seat, which I'm, I understand Supervisor Raphael Mandelman wants to run for, although Shimon Walton may run against him for that assembly seat. In the meantime, because of the way we've changed things. 2024 is a presidential year. It's also a year that the, mayor's, the mayor will be on the ballot. Now, I know this because I've actually seen a lot of this polling. London Breed is very unpopular in San Francisco. Although oddly, she's not getting blamed for the fentanyl crisis or for the homeless crisis or for crime. She's always managed to defer that blame onto somebody else. But nevertheless, she is not very popular. Her negatives are high. Her positives are not that high. I do not see the only candidate who's announced running against her is Supervisor Asha Safai. There will be others, right? There's going to be a race for mayor, right? Unless Dianne Feinstein, well, maybe Dianne Feinstein decides she can't continue in the United States Senate, all right? Which is entirely possible. Her health is not great. She decides she can't get, retain and finish her term, which means Gavin Newsom gets to appoint the next senator, and he has promised that he will appoint a black woman. Um, and it won't be Barbara Lee, sadly. Um, I like Barbara Lee. But it could be Karen Bass, the mayor of L.A., or London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, in which case that opens up, all right? Um, and then Aaron Peskin becomes mayor of San Francisco temporarily, and then the Board of Supervisors chooses the next mayor who will run as an incumbent, all right? Confused yet? It gets better. <laughs> Meanwhile, we will have district supervisor races in one, three, five, seven, and nine. And already we have several groups. One of them is called Grow SF, and one of them is called Abundant SF. And they're all funded by big tech. And they're raising millions and millions of dollars to get rid of Supervisor Connie Chan and Supervisor uh, Dean Preston in one and five. That is what they're about. Right? They're about getting rid of progressives on the board of supervisors, and they will have unlimited cash to do this through independent expenditure committees. All right. Um, 
it's going to be a wild year. I am hearing rumors that the big tech and big real estate, which is funding these independent expenditure groups, wants to repeal district elections. If we repeal district elections, it is game over for the left in San Francisco, right? Because before district elections, the mayor controlled the board of supervisors and big money controlled the board of supervisors. And you needed such so much money to run citywide for the board of supervisors that none of the current incumbents could possibly have gotten elected, right? If that happens, we all have to drop everything that we're doing and stop that and work to preserve district elections. If that is on the ballot, that will be the single most important thing that any of us can do in San Francisco for progressive values. More important than the mayor's race, more important than the supervisor's races. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if they can legally get away with it because the courts have been ruling that you cannot pass political legislation that undermines minority voting strength. And it would if you went citywide. I don't know how they're going to do this, but that's also out there for 2024. Okay, I've talked long enough. I'll stop and take questions. And I'll start with the first one here that somebody gave me. Driverless vehicles in SF, I believe. What will be done about them? Okay, this is a classic example of something that San Francisco has been very bad at. Right? The tech companies, the tech industry is very good at asking for forgiveness, not permission. Right? Uber operated and Lyft operated illegally for years. They were operating as illegal taxi cabs, violating the city's taxi ordinance and putting the traditional cab drivers out of business. And Ed Lee, as mayor, looked the other way and in fact told his taxi commissioner, told the head of the taxi commission, who I had lunch with and who left shortly afterwards, do not bother Uber and Lyft, their local tech companies. Right? Now they're doing this with the driverless cars. The city is not very good at regulating technology in advance. Next, we're going to see where they're already, they're already looking at this, delivery, robot deliveries. A robot is going to deliver your pizza to your house. All right. What could possibly go wrong with this? I live in Bernal Heights where the sidewalks are narrow and there are a lot of seniors and people who have a little mobility issues in my neighborhood. And there's going to be a robot on the sidewalk driving up to my house to deliver my son a pizza. My kids will love this. They, you know, they love technology. They'll love the idea of the robot. Or they're going to have a drone deliver it. What could possibly, well, we are allowing this experiment because San Francisco is not very good at regulating technology before it gets out of control. The robot cars, the driverless cars are getting out of control. And by the way, they are not quite there yet. A bunch of them got caught in the fog on the west side of town recently and their sensors didn't work in the fog. So they went round and round and round in circles and the people inside couldn't get out, All right? So this is here. The technology is not ready yet, and the city needs to better regulate these because people are going to get run over and killed. Oh, of course. Yes, stop share. There you go. Okay. Okay, I'll try to go through them as many as I can. Okay, so is Gavin Newsom close to London Bridge? The answer is yes. Gavin Newsom is close to London Breed. Is Gavin Newsom close to London Breed? Yes, the two of them are close. Um, and have been since they were much younger politicians. They, they both honestly share the same basic political approach. And I know this sounds cynical, but both of them are primarily about themselves, right? And the, in my mind, the politicians who drive me crazy the most are not liberals or conservatives. It's not ideological. The thing that drives me the craziest is politicians who care only about themselves and don't come in with any particular ideology. Right, who don't believe that I'm getting elected because I'm part of a movement that believes in this. And there are conservatives who are principled conservatives who want to get elected because they believe that we should make government smaller and lower taxes. Right? There are people who honestly believe that they want to get elected because they want to raise taxes on the rich. Right? And then there are people who want to get elected because they want the job. And then they want the next higher job. And they don't really care what their politics are. London Breed, two years ago, made a big speech about defunding the police. She was going to take $100 million from the police department and put it into programs for the black community. Now she's all about the police. Hire more cops, hire more cops. Why? Because she thinks the politics of the city have changed, in part because of her own media narrative. And this is where she needs to be. All right. Gavin Newsom's pretty much the same way. He's always been all about Gavin Newsom. And they're both pretty much neoliberals who believe that we should let the private market run things and things will be better for all of us. So yes, they are. So, it's hard to tell. It's really hard. To, there's so many here. Um, here's a question from the Zoom bunch. Um, can San Francisco be saved? Yeah, we can't hear you. Um, 
Okay. Um, the question is from <clears throat> one of the Zoom people. Can San Francisco be saved? Don't this, the, the, the current membership, leadership vacuum in San Francisco, um, use it, can't we use that as an opportunity? Uh, do progressives have a vision and an answer to take advantage of that? Would 48 Hills publish um, a, um, a, a job description for mayor? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. It's a good question. I would love to publish a job description for mayor. Um, yeah, I actually think that progressives do have a vision for a more just and equitable city. And I'll, I use that word for a reason. You know the, that equity is different than equality, right? Um, Susan Feinstein has written a book called The Just City, which is really brilliant and important and impossible to read because she's such an academic. She's at Harvard and she writes like an academic. It's like, it's, it's like you know, you, you have to plow through the, but she does say, and it's very important, equity is by definition redistributive, right? Equity means we don't all start in the same place, right? And we, I think we do have a vision. It has been very difficult because we have, this is the other thing too. There's these books out, this guy, Michael Schellenberger wrote this book called San Francisco and it's called How Progressives Ruin Cities. And when I read it, I was like, dude, you don't know anything about San Francisco politics. We have a very strong mayor in San Francisco. The mayor runs the city. The supervisors do not run the city. And we have not had a progressive mayor in San Francisco since Art Agnes. That was a long time ago. We have conservative and neoliberal mayors. So I think the progressives have a vision. We haven't been able to get anywhere with it, in part because we have not been able to get someone elected mayor. And I don't know if that's going to change this time. I don't know who's going to step forward, who has a chance of winning and run against London Breed. Here are two questions that I'm going to kind of combine about drugs. Um, fentanyl, where does it originate, originate and can't the source be attacked? And then the other one is how does New York City provide affordable housing for the people who can help, which can help the addicted? Yeah. Okay, I'm not an expert on affordable housing in San Francisco, but I will tell you that there's only one way to provide affordable housing. And that is through the public sector through government subsidies. The federal government used to give cities money to build public housing. And for all the problems with public housing, it's better than homelessness, right? And now, by the way, we actually know how to do public housing right. Then the more recent public housing developments um, are much safer and better. Um, in many countries, in Stockholm, for example, 80% of all the housing is social housing, is not in the private sector. 80% of all housing social housing. That's the only way that we're going to get out of this. And it's, and it's going to have to come from the federal government and to a certain extent, the state. Remember when we had like a $100 billion or like $50 billion state surplus? If we'd spent that on affordable housing, instead of giving some of it back to the taxpayers in terms of giving people who have cars a rebate for gas prices, whatever, um, think of what we could have done. All right. So it's going to cost money. Building the amount of affordable housing that San Francisco has promised to build under the housing element is going to cost $19 billion. Every single politician I've asked about this, including the ones who approved the housing element and the mayor who has trumpeted the housing element as this great thing, I have asked, where's the $19 billion going to come from them? And they all go, uh, I don't know, because we don't have it. That's the only way we're going to do this is if we can get Washington. And you know, it's interesting. HUD used to pay for housing in cities, right? And this was a big, this was Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. It was all about giving money to cities to build housing for, for low-income people. That went away under Reagan and it's never come back. It didn't come back under Obama. It didn't come back under Biden. They have not fully funded HUD. And no one, this has not become a national issue the way so many other things that Biden is talking about are national issues. It needs to be. We need to make housing a national issue and we need to make subsidized housing a national issue and get some of that federal money. But yes, I think we do have a vision and we need the organizing capability to carry it out. Here's, here's sort of an interesting question that relates to indirectly. A new apartment building has been put up in the Excelsior, but I've heard that PG&E will not hook up the 100 plus units in relation uh, to San Francisco municipal electricity. Can you comment on this? I sure can. That's one of my favorite topics in the world. I've spent a large part of my life writing about PG&E. Um, San Francisco is slowly but steadily moving towards public power. Right? We have not 
taken the step we need to do, which is to seize the grid. I'll come back to that in a second. But PG&E sees this as an existential risk, right? If they lose San Francisco to public power, they lose their single most profitable part of their entire network. Selling electricity in San Francisco is extremely profitable because the buildings are close together. So you don't have to run long lines and you don't have to pay people to drive all around and do me. It's, it's very profitable to run power in a, a big city. So PG&E does not want San Francisco to get to, to provide its own power anywhere. In fact, when San Francisco was going to use municipal power to turn on the light bulb in a bathroom for muni drivers out by Ocean Beach, we built the bathroom for muni drivers out by Ocean Beach, right? It needs a light bulb so they can see when they go in there. Right. PG&E said they would not hook that. They would not connect that to the grid unless the city spent like fifty thousand dollars on a transformer that you would need for like a two hundred unit building. This is for one light bulb. Right? That's because PG&E is being very vindictive and is trying to get back at San Francisco and stop us from having public power. Right. There is state legislation on this forcing them to do it. There is local. The biggest drawback now to opening new affordable housing in San Francisco is PG&E because they won't connect us to the grid without very expensive equipment that these buildings don't need because they're being vindictive and they don't want us to use, they don't want us to use municipal power to serve these things. Now, the solution to this, of course, is to get rid of PG&E. And the only way to do that is to take over the grid. I'll be with you in one second. The only reason to do that is to take over the grid. All right. And the only way to take over the grid, since PG&E will not sell it, is by eminent domain. And the city attorney is reluctant to do this. It will be expensive and take a while, but you know what they say about planting trees? The best time to plant a tree was um, 10 years ago. The second best time is today. If we'd done this 10 years ago, we'd have public power today, right? We need to file an eminent domain action, seize PG&E's grid by eminent domain. We'll end up having to pay for it, fair market value, which is probably about a billion, a billion and a half now. It's kind of old, right? We can sell revenue bonds to cover that cost and pay for it by selling electricity in San Francisco. And every time I have run these numbers myself, we come out way ahead, two, three, four hundred million dollars a year to the good from doing this. But that requires decisive civic action to seize the PG&E grid. In the meantime, we are stuck with this rogue utility that is really making it hard for San Francisco to make any progress. Okay. What do you think of the prospects for using the initiative process? to get through, to get truly progressive change, mixed income, public housing, um, payer housing, something I can't read, public financing of elections, uh, restoration of the safety net, mental health, I'm say I, I'm, I'm for that one, uh, community services. Well, we've started and progressives have passed two major initiatives in the last five years through the ballot initiative to raise taxes on bigger corp the biggest corporations in town and very high-end real estate sales to fund affordable housing. And guess what? We're getting about $110 million a year from Prop I, which is a tax on, it's an increased transfer tax on real estate sales of more than $10 million, right? So there may be people in this room who buy and sell real estate worth more than $10 million. I suspect we're a minority. I certainly don't. Um, this is big real estate investors. That's bringing $110 million a year, which the voters were told was going to go for affordable housing and rent subsidies and all of these things that we desperately need in the city. The problem is in California, because California, thanks since Prop 13, California has made taxes very difficult. In California, you cannot put a tax on the ballot and earmark it for a specific purpose unless you get two thirds of the vote which is impossible, right? So, because 20% of the voters are gonna be against any new taxes. So now we're trying to get 75% of a universe of 80%, right? So what, the, what Dean Preston and the progressives did is they put this on the ballot as a general purpose tax, right? And then they did trailing legislation at the Board of Supervisors saying this is to be used for affordable housing. Well, guess what? Mayor London Breed has refused to spend that on housing. She has taken that money and put it into her general fund budget, and it's going for things like more cops, and she refuses to spend it on affordable housing. Why? Because the progressives put it on the ballot. This is absolutely true. She is vindictive because she, it wasn't her idea, and because she hates Dean Preston, and because Dean Preston and the progressives put this on the ballot, she refuses to spend it on affordable housing because that would be a success for us. This is absolutely true. I'm not making this up. She was asked at question time 
the Board of Supervisors, will you spend that money that was earmarked by the voters for affordable housing? And she said, no, you should have gotten two thirds and called it a specific tax. It's a general tax. I'm going to spend it on anything I want to. That is absolutely true. So it is challenging, even with the initiative process, to make the city work with the strong mayor system that we have and with a mayor who does not, not only doesn't want to work with the progressives, is actively working against us. Yeah. Um, is Scott Weiner primarily about himself, or does he have beliefs <coughs> and principles, even if he is not perfect? He is not perfect. I actually think that Scott Weiner has an ideological agenda beyond himself. He is a very ambitious politician. He has been looking at that seat in Congress since he arrived in San Francisco, whatever, 20 years ago. He is a very ambitious, but I think he also has a very strong neoliberal ideology. I think he believes in market-based solutions. I think he believes in uh, a strong police presence. Um, I think that he believes that, um, um, as I, I, yeah, I think he is a classic kind of neoliberal politician, but I think he actually has principles and things he believes in. He also believes very strongly in a lot of very progressive social issues. I, I mean, I will give him credit. Scott Weiner is the person who got us, got that bill through the assembly and the state Senate that would have allowed safe injection sites in San Francisco if the mayor hadn't, if the, mayor, if the governor hadn't vetoed it. So yeah, I think he does have a strong ideological agenda. We're doing all the written questions, please. And if you wouldn't mind writing a question, we'll take it up there. Yet another question about fentanyl. Um, why? Well, let's see if we get through those. Yeah, those how fentanyl is, why is it so prevalent in this city and can't the pushers be stopped? It's prevalent all over the country, um, fentanyl. And it's prevalent because, first of all, Big Pharma invented this very, very potent opiate that is a very effective painkiller in very small doses, right? It is easy to manufacture and it's incredibly cheap. And it is not, it is manufactured all over the world. It is manufactured in other countries. Um, and it is easily imported into the United States because it's very, you don't need very much. Right? It's cheap, it's easy to manufacture and it's easy to transport. It is a very difficult challenge cracking down on fentanyl importers and dealers. And no matter what Trump says about you know, the people crossing the border from Mexico carrying fentanyl, that's not how most fentanyl gets into the United States, right? You can bring fentanyl into the United States on an airplane, you can bring it on a boat, you can bring it in all kinds of ways. It is mostly not manufactured in the United States. What? Big Pharma manufactures fentanyl in the United States, and some of that is no doubt getting into the underground market. But a lot of this is cheaply manufactured drugs being brought into the United States and sold on the streets, and it's incredibly dangerous. Here's a, here's a, um, a question which uh, needs to be answered. Um, I think, anyway, what is a neoliberal? That's a very good question. And I use I throw that term around a lot. Um, David Harvey has a great book I highly recommend to all of you called A Short History of Neoliberalism. Um, a ne neoliberalism really started with Reagan and Thatcher. And it is a belief that the private sector is has a better solutions than the public sector, that the public sector should be limited at best, and that reducing taxes and allowing, it's also known as trickle-down economics, reducing taxes and allowing rich people to have more money will eventually make all of us better, right? That's the basic concept of neoliberalism. Right? And it is really a dominant force now. Now, it, this goes all the way back to the battle between Keynes and von Hayek in the 20s and the 30s, when um, John Maynard Keynes convinced everyone from Roosevelt on that active government intervention in the economy is good, and that taxing great wealth and rich people and using that to redistribute wealth actually is better for the economy. And that attitude lasted really up until about 1978 when Jimmy Carter, not Ronald Reagan, started cutting taxes on big corporations and then went through Ronald Reagan. In the meantime, of course, the academic world of economics was all Keynesians, except for the small cadre led by a guy named von Hayek with his chief disciple, a guy named Milton Friedman. And they used to meet in... Um, the, in Switzerland, in Montparnasse in Switzerland, once a year for a conference where they came up with all of these ideas about how to dismantle Keynesianism. And Milton Friedman actually said, it's good to have radical ideas because should the situation exist where they could be implemented, it's good to have ones ready and, 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 and ready to go. And that's what happened in 1980, the late 70s, because there's a lot of history, but in the late 70s, when we had double digit inflation, massive unemployment, all this economic crisis, and if I had two hours, I could explain why. Um, 
Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher in England came along and, and started adopting the ideas of von Hayek and Friedman, which brought us the neoliberalism that has brought us. We were not, this country was not in debt in 1980. Right? We're now heavily in debt and the Republicans are blaming it on, on social spending. No, it's tax cuts that put us in debt. It is 100% tax cuts that put us in debt. And there were no homeless people in 1981 when I moved to San Francisco. It was the end of federal social, of the, end of the federal social safety net and housing money that has created this crisis. And that is what neoliberalism is. I highly recommend David Harvey's book, H-A-R-V-E-Y, A Short History of Neoliberalism. I also highly recommend Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, which all of you should read which is about the role that racism has played in all of this and all of the economic and social crisis in society. And unlike Susan Feinstein, Heather McGee can actually write. It's easy to read. Here's a question that David um, Do you see an increase in anti-Asian hate in 2023, 24? Well, we've certainly seen an increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. Some of this, the fault of, well, a lot of things are the fault of Donald Trump. Some of this, the proximate fault of Donald Trump, who blamed COVID on China. Remember that? He used all kinds of racist terms that I'm not even going to repeat today to blame COVID on China. And that actually spurred a lot of anti-Asian hate crimes. Um, we are seeing hate crimes against LGBT people, against trans people, against Asians, against Black people, against Latinos. This all comes out of, I think, the Trump MAGA movement which is all about the other, right? It's all about creating the, the idea of the other. Mega is about just like this guy we just watched on the video, right? This is our country and they are trying to take it away from us. Our country means white people and they is anyone who is not a straight, white, traditional Christian. The country is, try, we're supposed to fill out forms for questions. The country is being taken. And this leads to, this proximately leads to violence. We have seen that. Are we filling out forms or are we just, I, yeah, yeah. How can a progressive win a race for mayor when Breed and her backers have all the money? That is a really challenging question. How can a progressive win a race for mayor when Breed and her backers have all the money. It is very difficult to win a race for mayor in San Francisco when you've, you're up against $10 million in independent expenditure money. Um, I will say that when Mark Leno and Jane Kim ran with a real ranked choice voting strategy, we almost did it. It was very, very close. And I believe that if that strategy had started six months earlier, one of them might've won. Right? I think London Breed's Poll numbers are low, and I think a progressive could actually win in San Francisco. But we've got to find the right person to step forward and run. Um, and so far, I'm not seeing anybody who is a progressive winner stepping forward to run. This is uh, going back to the PG&E um, uh, proposal that you suggested. If, if San Francisco took over PG&E in San Francisco, would San Francisco be responsible for all of PG&E's territory? No. Um, I mean, the state could do that. I think it would be if, it would be great if the state took over PG&E and broke it up into four or five municipal utilities. Um, but municipal utilities in California and in the United States typically are local or regional. Um, Sacramento Municipal Utility District is basically Sacramento County. If San Francisco took over PG&E, it would be the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission running a local municipal utility. We would not be responsible for all of PG&E's territory outside of San Francisco. This is only one more, one more, question, one more question that's been uh, handed me anyway. You, are, you mentioned organized retail theft. Yes. What do you think should be done to stop it? Well, again, that's a very, very difficult question. There is organized retail theft. Um, it is not, by the way, as bad as the media narrative portrays it. Remember that big story about the guy who rode his bicycle into Walgreens with the plastic bag? Did you all see this? There was video of this. And oh, the security guard didn't stop him. The security guard at Walgreens is not supposed to arrest people. In fact, Walgreens has now hired armed security guards. Very bad idea. They just shot a person on Market Street, right? 
was shot and killed by a security guard over, I don't even know if there was a retail theft involved, but you don't shoot and kill people over a $5 bottle of shampoo, right? That person who was riding around on the bicycle, putting things in the plastic bag was arrested under Chesa Boudin and was prosecuted, right? So it's very difficult to stop organized retail theft. Um, it comes back to me as does so much else to economic inequality. You know, I will just say this. I have a friend who I went to college with, who after he got out of college, went and got a PhD in criminology. Spent six years of his life getting a PhD in criminology. And after he finished, he was out in San Francisco for a conference and we went out and had beers. And I said, so Wayne, what do criminologists really do? And he said, well, we, we study the causes of crime. And I was like, great, Dr. Logan. After six years, what have you figured out? What are the causes of crime? And he pauses for a moment. And then he looks at me and says, poverty. All right. I think we should stop now because you're going to head to your service and it's, it's 10 minutes to 11. Thank you all so much for sitting here and listening. It's been great talking to you. One more, one more question. Yay. Oh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I asked a question about anti-Asian hate. Yeah. Actually, maybe I didn't phrase my question uh, clearly mm -hmm. enough. What I'm wondering about is the dynamics of the election in 20, 2024. It, what? Yeah. yeah. My question is really this. What happens in the election next year? Because of the only thing that Democrats and Republicans agree on is, is the anti-China. Yep. The only thing that the Republicans and Democrats agree on is the animosity towards China. So I'm sure that would become a huge issue in the election. How would that affect the anti-Asian hate in this country? It's an excellent question, and I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I am... I have spent my entire life focusing on local politics as opposed to national and global politics. So I am absolutely unqualified to talk about national politics towards China. But I do think that, I mean, we saw what happened when Trump stirred up the anti-Chinese hate. It does, the, the broader xenophobia and the otherism and the blaming other countries for our problems does have consequences and it does lead to violence. There's no question about it. And I, I really, I don't know the answer to how that's going to play out in the election. I really don't know. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. That was excellent. I, I learned a, a great deal. And it, you know, raises a lot of questions. I think that we need to get into more. Um, yeah, it was a really uh, an eye-opener for me in many respects. I want to just announce a uh, forum going forward. There will not be a forum next week, um, but there will be in two weeks. In two weeks, we're going to have a forum um, that's called No World War Three. So it's not going to be a light discussion. <laughs> um, it's this system, not humanity, that needs to become extinct. And so this is a this is going to be a forum about the war in the Ukraine and other potential wars that are looming. Um, but it's going to be talking about some of the deeper problems, deeper structural systemic reasons why we continue to face war and that we are now facing the potential of a catastrophic third world war. Okay, so that's going to be next two in two weeks. That'll be May 14th. And I hope you can come with your questions. Um, it's going to be a bit controversial, but I think it's going to be stimulating and important to get into. And then the week after that, we're going to have uh, Leslie Goldberg, who's here with us today, who's going to be uh, giving a presentation on her artwork. And by the way, this afternoon at 1230, there's going to be a reception for Leslie. She's Her artwork is around this room and in the uh, Martin Luther King room. Um, and you, you're, you know, should go around and check it out if you haven't already. And uh, that reception will begin at 1230 and the, I'm sorry, the forum will be May 21st. Okay. And I'm really looking forward to that as well. It's going to be very interesting, entertaining, and I think uplifting and, and fun. Okay. So anyway, that's it for today. Yeah. Lance. Yes. Oh, this, this program. Yeah. That, oh, that's a good question. Cause if you, um, you know what I'll there we have a we have a we have a website for this forum and all the forum all the um, videos are available there going all the way back 
you know, several years. So yeah, it'll be up and running soon. Okay. Yeah. What's that now? Oh, like and subscribe. Oh, okay. Okay. Like and subscribe on that website. Uh, but I'll tell you in particular, or we'll, I'll send out an email with that information for everybody. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you for coming everyone. And, um, See you in two weeks. Okay.